This is a virtual talk by Dr. Jim Herring of Dunbar and District History Society. Hello. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Jim Herring, and this is the second of my virtual talks, initially done for Dunbar and District History Society, but have been passed on to other groups and other organisations. And the first video, which was on the first half of the 1899 map, has over 200 views on YouTube, and that's very rewarding for me. Uh, so I hope that you're going to enjoy this new talk, which is on the second half of the 1899 video. Now, what I recommend is that if you want to have a kind of experience that you might have coming to a talk, either at History Society or one of the other places where I've given talks, then you might want to link your tablet or your laptop, whatever you're watching it on, to your television and to sit back uh, perhaps a couple of metres, not social distancing, but uh, a couple of metres from your television just to get uh, a bigger picture and also to get the, maybe to get the atmosphere of a talk. So maybe try that. But... If not, I do hope that you will enjoy this presentation and we're now going to begin the second half of the 1899 map. We're going to first look at the third quadrant on the map here and what we're going to concentrate on is in the, the middle of the map there, the rifle range and the targets which were connected. We'll then look at the stone kists that were found along the shore and then we'll look at Wolkie Hall which is now part of Winterfield Golf Course and then at Winterfield Mains. So we'll look at the targets and rifle range first. The picture on the on the left here shows the first Edinburgh city RGA volunteers and RGA is the Royal Garrison Artillery and they would have come down soldiers dressed like this would have come down to Dunbar to practice as the, the first Midlothian Royal Garrison Artillery and so there were different uniforms and um, different caps and helmets so although these uh, men were volunteers they still uh, dressed in uniform and uh, used live ammunition uh, when firing at the targets. On the right this is the Queen's Edinburgh Rifle Brigade on Lanark Muir and they're uh, practicing and obviously this is a, uh, a painting or drawing and it's from the Illustrated London News. Again, slightly different helmets there, but again, although these are volunteers, they are all in uniform. So continuing with their targets and rifle range, one of the first users of the range was the first Harrington Artillery Volunteers, and they were based in Dunbar in the, what was called the Volunteers Hall. And this is now the British Legion in the High Street. And where the cellar is now in the British Legion, that was where the Harrington Artillery Volunteers kept their armoury. So what was once full of guns and ammunition is now full of beer. All round, all year, the weekends, uh, the, the Harrington men came down, but you also had from 1873 the Harringtonshire Rifles and then the Yeomanry uh, who were based at the, the, the newly built barracks in Dunbar in 1855. Uh, they also used the targets from 1861 onwards. Now I'm grateful for it. They are given me here by David Anderson, uh, who is a much more expert on this than I am. They would also say that there were things called summer camp days and uh, artillery from and uh, 
like Edinburgh and Fife and from other parts of Scotland came during the summer uh, to use the target. So they were obviously quite uh, popular and very effective targets. It was a, an ideal location, perhaps, for using them. And lastly, uh, when the military volunteers weren't using the, the targets in the rifle range, then you had local groups such as Mason, Foresters and Shepherds and uh, they, they were formed into rifle teams and, and they had a local league competition. So for, for some people, shooting rifles at the weekend was obviously uh, quite an active pastime. Uh, although it's obviously um, faded out now. Okay, so if we move now to the stone kiss which is identified on the map, uh, this is a typical stone kiss that might be found uh, between the, the, the 4th and 7th centuries. And what we can see here in this example is the, is the solid walls uh, and would have a solid base as well. Uh, this one is obviously uh, inland and it has some standing stones at the side. But as we'll see, the Belhaven Kists were slightly different from this, both in location and in formation. So the Belhaven Stone Kiss, there was an article written on this, uh, which David Anderson alerted me to, and it was in 1905, and the author who had found the stone kiss, presumably, uh, and said this, the kiss are all of them in the shell sand. Now, we'll see a photograph in a moment of uh, where the kiss might have been. And there is a mixture below the, the turf on the golf course, a mixture of sand and shells. They also said they were at a uniform level of about four feet, uh, seven feet above the high water mark, and they're almost at the exact distance of six feet. So they were very carefully laid out. And we'll make a comment on that in a second. And these were called long graves. And they were 14 inches by 10 inches. Now it struck me that this was quite small. And well, maybe in the fifth to seventh centuries, people were a lot smaller then uh, than they are now. Uh, but it did seem to be very narrow. So, so I looked up uh, the size of modern coffins, as you do, and uh, found that modern coffins are, are 24 inches wide. And just below the website that told me about this, there was another website that says how to make your own coffin. Now, you'd obviously have to plan fairly well in advance of that, and but it also gave advice to say, that if you are making your own coffin, then you can't make it any wider than 28 inches. And this is because it won't fit through the crematorium curtains. So if you're thinking of doing that, just take that advice. OK, so that's a little bit of trivia. So let's get back to more serious business. Uh, the Stone Kiss, the author of 1905, said that uh, they weren't formed of single slabs unlike the one we saw uh, above and uh, that there were slabs across the top and the sides. Now I found an, a 2016 article and this was um, given to me by East Lothian, the East Lothian Archaeology Department of the of East Lothian Council and uh, they said that most of the, the kiss um, are thought to date from 400 to 650. Now in the 1905 article, the, the author said that these were early Christian burials. So what exactly he meant by that, I'm not quite sure. But this is more up-to-date information. And it said, uh, and they are quite regular in construction. Uh, and the modern author said this is part of a local burial tradition. So there were burial traditions in different parts of uh, the UK. and but. In this area, then the regular uh, construction, as it said above, that they were exact distance of six feet from each other, is part of a local burial tradition. 
The article in 1905 ends up by saying that local legend had it was that these burials uh, were Vikings who were washed up, uh, but this has been disproven. Okay, if we look at where the kiss found, uh, I took this photo uh, last week, and you, if you go along from Belhaven Bridge, um, there's a round concrete like tower, so it's just a bit to the left of that. And you can see that the the banking uh, of the of what is the golf course now, uh, the kiss would have been in the banking like that. However, if we look at the photo carefully, the, the, there's been a lot of erosion, obviously, in the past 1600 years. And so it's not that hard to imagine that the banking actually came out to where the edge of the sand and the rocks, the little um, stones there. Uh, so that's round about where they were found, but there's no uh, evidence of <coughs> any um, surviving kiss, as far as we know. Now, just next to the picture on the left, I took this photograph, which shows two slabs, which you think would have been ideal for making the kiss, and as the author in 1905 said, that they weren't made of one just one slab but you can see how these these slabs could have been used for a base for a side um, for a top now obviously one of the questions would be what would be whether there are other kiss underneath the golf course it's it, in theory it's possible but it's likelihood is that if these were constructed at the edge of uh, the, the shore then that was a deliberate act on the people on the part of the people um, who buried them. And finally, we don't know who did the burying. We don't know who the people were that were buried. Presumably they were local people um, who had died. Okay, so if we move along the golf course to Wilkie Hall, and this is an area which, if you're standing at the end of Winterfield Prom and looking across to St. Margaret's, the golf club house, um, of Winterfield Golf Club, then that's Wilkie Hall. And in the 1820s, well, and previously to that, it had been what's called a marrow quarry. Now, um, David Anderson told me this, and I didn't know what it was, but I looked it up. So a marrow quarry is where you find clay and limestone together. And this was last worked in the 1820s uh, by a man that we'll say more about. David France of the Seafield Brickworks. And we'll say quite a bit more about the Seafield Brickworks um, further on in the talk. I found a reference to Wilkie Hall in the 1854 name book, and it said it was a small field of rough pasture. And it was used by fishermen um, from, for drying their nets. And as we'll, we'll see, it's, it's an ideal area for that. So. The other reference that I found was a geology book of 1838, and it said at Wilkie Hall, a great mass of greenstone rises through the strata and traverses them in veins for several hundred yards. Now, uh, I had vaguely heard of greenstone, but when I looked it up, it, it's, uh, it said the greenstone was formed over 600 million years ago as molten rock pushed through layers of limestone to form this this greenstone. And it's um, it, it's used today as it's um, for making uh, jewellery, and uh, also on the on the website that I, that I found it said that legend has it that if you carry a piece of greenstone, then it will keep you safe and healthy. But also said that legend says that if you don't get permission from the authorities for taking a piece of greenstone, perhaps that you find uh, by accident then if you don't get permission, the fairies will come and take you away. Okay, so here's Wilkie Hall as it is now. And so this is looking from St. Margaret from Winterfield Golf Club across to the first tee. Uh, and you can see that it's a, it's a fair size of an area and it's not hard 
uh, to think that at one time it might have been a quarry. It was later used for agriculture, so there could have been crops grown there. And if you look at it from the reverse photograph, looking west from the first tee, then you can see that uh, it's just at the shore and the reference to the fishermen using it for drying their nets. Uh, and you can easily imagine this, this area could be used for that. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a very picturesque location. You can see the beach, uh, you can see Bilhaven Beach in the distance, and just uh, on the right there, you can see North Bay Law. Okay, so if we go back along past Bilhaven Bridge and just turn left, we'll get to what was once Winterfield Mains Farm. Now, before 1800, this was broken into a number of smaller farms, and there was maybe 10 to 20 tenants, David Anderson told me, but then became one big farm. And the, the big hoose, if you like, the, the farmer who, who owned the farm, but didn't necessarily uh, work the farm, lived at Winterfield House. And Winterfield House then became Bill Haven Hill School, and the building uh, is still there if you go up the back road. There was a farmhouse on the, at Winterfield Mains itself, and but this is now Winterfield House, and you can see Winterfield House uh, at the at the bottom of Back Road or just along the the shore road there. If you look at the photo there, we can see that, that this is the area where the chalets are now. Now, when the map was drawn up at the end of the 19th century, then this area would have been part of the farm and it would have had barns and stables for horses. There'd be lots of horses there, some cart houses and stack yards. And David Anderson has said to me that if you're walking down to uh, the back road and to where Winterfield House is now, if you look at some of the walls, then you can see remains of the farm. They're still there. And to the left of that, you can see Manor House. Now, I'm sure that when the Manor House is on the map, but we're not going to go into it in any detail here, but and I'm sure there wouldn't be this muckle tree in front of the house, and it certainly wouldn't be painted um, the colour it is now. But it was uh, one of the, the buildings uh, in, in Dunbar, and certainly in Bilhaven at this time. Now, we talked about uh, Winter Winterfield Farm, we talked about the, the farmhouse there, the big house up the road. Uh, but, so we know something about the, the people that own the farm and uh, some of the factors that worked on the farm. What we don't know is, is really anything about the, the people who, who worked on the farm. And in the 19th century, working conditions on farms were, in some cases, pretty horrendous. Uh, one thing we have to remember is that a farm might employ up to 30 people. The, the, this is pre mechanization and so you would have lots of people looking after horses, and that, not just the plough, the ploughman, the first ploughman, the, the head ploughman who would have the best horses, and then the second ploughman, the third ploughman, etc. Uh, but you might also have farriers on the farm, as well as those in, involved in uh, maintaining the sowing crops, gathering crops in, etc. At this time, and, and for a long time thereafter, uh, farm workers were lived in tied cottages. And this meant that their, uh, their employment the, the, was linked to the house that they were given. And in many cases where you, you, you look at um, census figures, etc., you can see that there 
Whereas there might have been a few people living up in uh, Winterfield House, Billhaven Hill School now, uh, there could have been seven or eight people living in a, a small cottage uh, just along from Winterfield Main's farm. So the, although people, it's often argued that people who worked on farms were, were healthy and had more access to, um, to better uh, food in terms of vegetables in particular, uh, and th that is no doubt true. That you still had, um, it was a very hard life working on a farm. One of the things that uh, went on up until the 1950s uh, were hiring fairs. Now, the, you will come across, if you look up hiring fairs, what you'll sometimes come across is, is the pictures of happy looking farmers and happy looking workers uh, exchanging. Uh, views and, and, and uh, agreeing to, to work for the farm for a year. Uh, but in, in many cases, uh, this was, was really not the case at hiring fairs. It was, it, was, it was not in any way a dignified procedure where people had to line up and farm and walk along and inspect uh, both the men and the women and the children. And some some farmers were very fussy about how they took. I can remember uh, my auntie Mamie telling me that um, that one of the hiring fairs that she was at in the 1930s with my grandfather uh, is that the farmer said to my granny that uh, he would take her and the children, but he wouldn't take uh, my grandfather. And this is because my grandfather was uh, a union representative for the Farm Servants Union. Uh, which tells you something about the way they were treated uh, itself, and that later became the Farm Workers Union. And people on farms worked long hours and, and in all weathers. And, and uh, if, if you want to think for a minute about someone working at Wilkie Hall and the east wind coming off the sea, uh, then it wasn't very pleasant. So we need to have a bigger picture um, when we're looking at things like uh, Winterfield main farms and not just concentrate on uh, the people that owned them. Okay, so that was the third quadrant and in that we went from the rifle range in the 19th century with the volunteer soldiers coming from Edinburgh and Harrington and also local groups uh, such as the Masons using the rifle range at weekends when the army wasn't using it. And then we went back 1400 years to the fifth century and looking at the, the stone kiss. Now we've got no idea who was buried there or who did the burying and we will never know. And are there more kiss under the golf course? Well, in theory there could be, uh, but we just don't know about that at all. So. Then we went on to, to Wilkie Hall, as it is just now, as it is part of the golf course. It used to be farmland, used to be where the fishermen hang their nets. And then we went along to Winterfield Mains, which is on the map, and Winterfield House, where, where the chalets are now, and with Manor House in the background. So we've covered quite a lot of time. And in now we move on to the fourth quadrant, and we're going to do something similar. Go from the, the 19th century, particularly in, in West Barnes and in Seafield, but also have a look at some of the houses and what they look like today. Okay, so if we move on to the, the fourth quarter now, what we're going to, to concentrate on here is on the left hand side of the, the map there uh, at West Barnes is the implement works and we'll say quite a bit about that. Uh, I'm not going to cover the brewery that was at uh, West Barnes. There is a brewery now in West Barnes, Winter Brewery, and it's actually in Implement Lane where the implement works were. We'll then uh, go, go west and we'll mention the Battle Blend, Rosebank, Rosebank Cottage, and in particular, the Seafield, the Seafield Brickworks, and the old kiln that was 
part of the brickworks. Okay, so we start with the, the implement works themselves. The company was known as Sheriff and Company, and that name still is in existence today. And the uh, agricultural website that I looked at said that Sheriff and Company made a number of sewing machines. And that is, means sewing machines as in sewing crops, uh, not uh, sewing machines for making uh, clothes. Sewing machines for crops, as it says, including drill crops and uh, implements and machinery, including manure distributors. Now, that's a uh, unusual uh, machine, if you like, and you still see them. You still occasionally see them today. Uh, so not very pleasant work, but uh, you need a machine for it. And then horse hose. Now, it was interesting when I looked at this website that there was an, quite a number of, of spelling mistakes on the website itself. And, and when I first saw horse hose, I thought, well, maybe that's, does it mean horseshoes? Uh, but it doesn't, it means horse hose. And I'd never heard of a horse hose before, so I contacted Douglas Robertson at North Belton Farm and, uh, and he gave me some information on this. Now, this is a picture of a horse hole from the European Parliament website and uh, it's as it says it's a, a, a hole coming that's made that makes drills and uh, or drills as we say in Scotland pulled by two horses and, and just steered by the man. So it looks like a plough but it didn't do the same work as a plough. This picture from the Border Ramblings website uh, shows women scattering seed and we're going to come back to that photograph in a second. Now horse holes were used for, in, as I said, for making drills, but they're also used for uh, when they were planting tatties and, and Douglas Robertson was telling me that, that um, they, I remember his father telling him about that and so basically what happened was the horses pulled the hole and some of the the horse hose had a dimple. So when the horse hose went along the drill, it left a dent. And the women coming behind planted the potatoes in each dent. So they were evenly spaced out as the farmer wanted them to do. Now, the women wore what was called a brat. And this is a new word to me um, in, in this context. And there was Robertson told me. Um, and in the picture on the right hand side, you can see that the, the woman on the right hand side is holding up like a Hessian sack and is distributing sowing grain, I think, from this one. But in East Lothian, in the farms here, the, the women wore brats and put the tatties in them too before they planted them. Now, the Dictionary of the Scottish Language, which is a a brilliant source for if you if you ever have a Scottish word that you're not certain about, then look it up in that and you'll get several examples. And this brat or bratty as it was called, um, part of north probably in Aberdeenshire, was a heavy Hessian over apron worn by women manual workers. And it says when they were doing rough or clarty work. And quite a lot if if you think about um sowing potatoes um in the pouring rain, as they, they must have done, then it could be very clarty. Now, I can remember that, uh, that, that, that when I was at school and, um, and as a student, then occasionally would go how can tatties, uh, along with, uh, with other people from the school. And I can remember that the women, quite a lot of the women wore this, uh, the, not the, it wasn't uh, an apron that folded up, it was just a, like an apron in front of the trousers. Um, to keep the trousers clean, and, and that would be called a brat as well. Okay, so the implement works. This is a quotation uh, from the agricultural website, and it's um, 
funny the, the Royal Agricultural Show. Now this means this is the National Agricultural Show. Uh, you're a Scottish one, a Welsh one, etc. And um, well, this was the national one, which was held all, all over Britain. And uh, this was in Newcastle in 1908. And it said that Messrs Thomas Sheriff and Company, which we'll see that Sheriff and Company became Thomas Sheriff and Company uh, of West Barn Sumbar. Uh, interesting language here it says have forward a drill, not have put forward a drill, but in other words, a demonstrating. Uh, a drill and broadcast seeder and also it says drill for corn and seed or turnip and mangold. The mangold, I had to look this up as well, is a, is a form of beet. It's not the same as sugar beet but it's a form of beet and it's used for um, for feeding crops. There's also a broadcast sower. So machinery uh, was being introduced so this broadcast sower may well have uh, replaced the, the when we saw the woman in the previous photograph uh, seeds being sown by hand and this photo from the Scottish Agricultural Implement Makers website where most of this information come from um, shows Sheriff and Company so your Sheriff and Company first as it's doing out and then uh, Thomas Sheriff uh, took it over from his father and this was uh, at the back of one of the uh, of their machines that they made. Okay, so just moving from West Bar towards Dunbar, um, you have the battle blend. And this picture was when it was, um, as it says on the market, was being sold um, after the hotel closed down. And you can see it's an impressive building with the two wings uh, and the, the tower in the middle. The Battle Blend was built in 1860 by William Brodie, uh, who was a brick manufacturer and, as we'll see, uh, was instrumental in, in expanding the, the brick and tile works that we'll discuss in a moment. His daughter, Marion Brodie, married Thomas Sheriff Jr. Now, Thomas, we saw above that Thomas Sheriff was of the, com the company that made uh, the machinery in West Barnsden at the implement works and she married the, the son and uh, and then she lived in the battle blend until uh, 1920 when she died and we'll, we'll hear a bit more about Marion Brodie in just going further along from battle blend so William Brodie he lived in Rosebank and this is now called Rosebank House um, before he built the battle blade, but as we'll see, Rosebank House, which today is a bed and breakfast, uh, guest house, uh, it's also quite an impressive building. In fact, it's when he built battle blade, the battle blade is further up on the hill, and maybe it was there just to be more impressive. Uh, but certainly, Rosebank House is. Uh, Know, is a sizable property for and, and for a man um, who owned the brickworks this was where people like William Brodie uh, would have lived in those days. Further along from Rosebank, Rosebank Cottage and this was first, uh, owned by Thomas Mitchell um, who was a soap manufacturer and uh, Pat Simpson has given me um, quite a lot of information on these houses and he was known as Soapy Mitchell unsurprisingly uh, and he built Rosebank Cottage now the Rosebank Cottage is now the lighthouse and if you're going from uh, the crossroads at Beverage Row out to West Barnes the lighthouse is the last house on the left hand side and that's before you have the new development uh, and it's actually it's called, there's, there's, uh, if you look through the gate, you'll see that it's called the lighthouse. So that's where he, where he lived. And the lands were later uh, sold to a man called David France. Now we, we heard of David France earlier on about um, Volky Hall. And so this was in the, uh, the early 19th century. 
and we'll hear more about these. Coming on now to the Seafield Brick and Tile Works, and it's important that, that uh, it's often referred to as Seafield Brick Works, but brick, bricks and tiles were in great demand in the, in the 19th century. Okay, so Seafield Brick and Tile Works were, these were established in the early 19th century by the David France that uh, we heard about above. And He bought the lands from uh, from Mr. Mitchell, uh, who had actually contested uh, the land from the count. Well, the council council had imposed ties on the land, and Sophie Mitchell took the council to court, and ties were all taken away. So he could then sell uh, the land to David France. Now, David France is uh, known as the man who built what's called the Divvy Dyke. Now, the Divvy Dyke is the wall. On your right hand side, if you're going from um, Bel Belhaven uh, down, down there, so for example, just uh, where, the, where the new um, surf headquarters are, and then you, the road up towards West Van Bridge is known locally as the Dump Road. And this was because in the 1950s, uh, the council, the Dunbar Town Council uh, used this as a, a landfill site, but it wasn't, they weren't called landfill sites, they were just called the dumps. Uh, and so that's what that, so what David France was, he built the wall and this stopped the land getting flooded. Because you can imagine before that, when there was a very high tide, the water just came over and flooded the area. Now, this is a very early brick making machine, um, which looks um, a bit complicated, but, but it's actually a fairly simple uh, mechanism. And the interesting thing here, of course, is that this is being drawn by a horse. Now, so, and this would, this would have been taking, this type of machinery would be in maybe the early 1800s, the late 1790s, etc. Um, in other words, before mechanization, before uh, steam came in the, the mid 19th century. So let's go back to William Brodie. Uh, he takes over in 1855 um, from David France. He takes over and he develops the business, greatly expands uh, this business and other um, brick and tile works that he had. And this is one of the, uh, the adverts for William Brodie uh, for making machines. Uh, so in other words, they didn't just make the bricks and the tiles in the factory. They also, because he was an engineer, he developed machines that could be sold to other brick and tile works. And as you can see here, it says improved pug mills and bruising rollers. Now, I've never heard of this before, so I looked it up. And a pug mill is a machine in which clay or other materials are mixed into a smooth consistency. And once the bricks, uh, the, the potential bricks come out of the, the, the pug mills uh, and are formed into uh, rectangles, then each one is called a pug. The bruising rollers, where it's where the, uh, it, this crust, the, this was used to crush or bruise grain uh, to make it more palatable for the stock who were feeding on it. So this is also used for turnips. So in other words, you put your grain or other things uh, through the, the bruising rollers and this presumably broke it down into smaller um, particles so that uh, the cows uh, or maybe horses who were eating it, uh, it was more palatable. So at the bottom it says that they also made steam engines and agricultural machinery. And this is William Brody, engineer, uh, so it says Seafield Brick and Tile Watch near Dunbar. Now, those are like my brother-in-law um, from West Barnes and my friend uh, from Belhaven. We're very pleased by this because Dunbar, West Barnes is going to them, not in Dunbar, and neither is Belhaven. So this was the Seafield Brickworks near Dunbar. And this advert and the other ones is from, um, if you're interested in, in uh, finding out more about 
the Seafield Brickworks and uh, other brickworks in Preston Pans and in other parts of Scotland, then Scottish Brick History is the place to go. And continuing with the Seafield Town and Brickworks, and uh, with William Brodie, who, who was, a, who was, who was um, really quite a remarkable entrepreneur uh, in his time. He, uh, as it said, was an engineer, but he had a huge business. And he also had his own ships, which took uh, bricks and tiles and machinery across to, for example, to Holland uh, and came back uh, with, for example, with coal. And this is, and this was um, one that got into trouble. So it says, the schooner of Williams of Dunbar, laden with coal, belonged to Mr. William Brodie of Bellhaven Tile Works, was driven against the back of the pier. And this was at the harbour, at Dunbar Harbour, losing her bowsprit, which went into shivers and damaged the forefoot. Now, not being of a nautical bent, uh, I had to look up bowsprit, and bowsprit is defined as a spar projecting from the upper end of the bow of a sailing vessel, so it sticks out in the front, basically. And this great, uh, great phrase, uh, it went to shivers. Uh, basically, this mean, didn't mean that it, that it got really, really cold and started to shake. When it went to shivers, it, it basically disintegrated, so it must have hit uh, the rocks or the pier, uh, and went to shivers. And uh, well, if you look up um, went to shivers, is one of the most common things you find is that in um, Scott's Ivanhoe, there's a description of that uh, Ivanhoe's spear went to shivers uh, when it struck his opponent's shields um, in, a, in, a, in a contest. And then says it damaged the forefoot, and the forefoot is um, the forward end of the keel of a vessel and really emerges, emerges um, out of the water. So it's at near the bottom of the boat. So I learned something there about uh, ships and boats. Also, there's um, in 1872 from the, the, the Shields Gazette, so there was launched on Saturday from the shipbuilding yard, the Coop Shipbuilding Company in Blythe, in the north of England, a very high class twin wood, twin wood twin screwed steamer, which is very hard to say, and it's built for Mr. William Brodie of Battleblade, near Dunbar again. And the vessel was christened by the fire brick by um, Marion Brodie, uh, whose daughter, as, as, as we saw above, who lived in uh, the Battle Blend until 1920. Now, just a couple of examples of where the Seafield bricks went. Uh, the first one is the Tay Bridge. And so when the Tay Bridge was built, there was a huge number of Seafield bricks which were used in its construction. Now, one of the quotations in the uh, the Brick, Scottish Brick History website, it says that when the disaster happened, when the tea bit collapsed, one of the journalists in the Scotsman had written that the the bricks had, had disintegrated. And Marion Brodie, who was the owner of the, the, the Seafield Brickworks, um, wrote to the Scotsman saying that um, this was not the case, and this was a slander, because it was the coping stones that had been damaged when the bridge collapsed and that the bricks uh, were still in place. So good, solid Seafield, Bellhaven bricks. Now, William Brodie also uh, was instrumental in getting the, um, the Fisherman's Monument erected at, uh, at the Old Harbour. And so this was, um, this is one of his um, charitable works. So the Brickworks was the event was owned by William Brodie and in 1877, as it says here, uh, it was handed over to his daughter, Marion. And it says Mrs. Marion Brodie or Sheriff. Now, if you remember, she married um, Thomas Sheriff. And uh, as we'll see in a moment, the, 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 the Brodie Sheriff name um, continued. 
and in the, the below there you can see that Marion Brodie has written from the battlement battle blend on the 12th of November 1877 saying that John Frame uh, would be looking after the works and he was <coughs> basically the manager of the works until they closed. The business was then sold by Marion Brodie in 1886 and one of the uh, the adverts um, prior to it closing was that uh, Seafield Brick and Tile Works, Dunbar, it says, and this was also owned by, um, had, had been owned by William Brodie and passed on to Marion Brodie, the West Bank Brick, Tile and Pottery Works at Portobello. And so it's um, it's bricks and tiles, but as you can see, it's, it's pipes. So pipes obviously are made from the same material as uh, roof tiles, and it says the best quality for my ship. So there, there was an enormous uh, demand for bricks and tiles in the, the middle of the 19th century. There's lots and lots of building going on, uh, mechanisation of farm, farm. Look at um, any slow day. If you go around the slow day, you'll see lots of chimneys. And it may well be that quite a lot of these chimneys are, are built with bricks. And here it says MB Sheriff, Marion Brody Sheriff, uh, Dunbar. And my, I guess that my my uh, my brother-in-law in West Barnes and my friend in uh, Belhaven would probably contest that that it should be MB Sheriff either of Seafield or West Barnes or Belhaven. Now, as with uh, Winterfield uh, Mains, when when we're talking about William Brodie, who is obviously a, a very uh, important man in his time and provided a lot of employment to people in uh, in Belhaven through the brickworks and elsewhere. Uh, what, and if we're looking at big houses like Battle Blend, uh, Rose Bank, what we have to remember is that, that there were a lot of people who worked in the, the brickworks that we, we know very little about. There are some uh, examples in some of the censuses uh, in the 1860s, 70s, 80s, uh, which identify people who worked in the brickworks. But if you thought that working in Winterfield Mains could be, um, could be quite very, very arduous at times, working in a brickworks was really was not something that you wanted to do. Uh, there were, this was in the middle of the Industrial Revolution. The working conditions were very poor uh, in brickworks as in other factories. And some of the quotations from people writing about uh, the, the brickworks, um, one uh, author wrote that uh, in very florid language, saying brute labour and brute intellect, uh, presumably on the part of the people who ran the brickworks, uh, is not to be coveted as an element, a social constitution of this extraordinary country. So there was, the, the implication here was that the, the, the conditions that the workers um, were in um, was not something to be proud of. and. In the, the Journal of the Builder in 1843, again from the, the Brickworks um, website, uh, identified that um, women worked in these, um, women and children also worked in Brickworks. And it said that little children who are a country that should be at school uh, are disguised past recognition in the mix of sweat and plastings of clay. Uh, which again, using Florida Lamb, encumbered in attenuated frames. Now, in the in the 1840s, um, there was a lot of malnutrition in the country. Now, what we don't know is um, to what extent the the working conditions in Seafield Brickworks were as bad as that. We would hope not. Um, and but even if um, William Brodie was um, a very uh, liberal and considerate employer. If you were working in the brickworks at Seafield, it would be very noisy, very dirty, possibly very dusty at times. And there was no doubt that there's very good evidence that people who worked in these kinds of factories had much shorter lives, uh, A, than people who worked on farms, and dramatically shorter lives than the people who owned the factories and lived in uh, houses such as the back. Okay, so 
that's um, that was the fourth quadrant, and um, so we've we've looked at the as the, the the implement works and sea field and battle plane. What I haven't looked at is uh, Manor House in any detail and um, Billhaven Brewery, and there's a there's a lot of history uh, attached to to both of these towns, but uh, not in this talk. So I hope you've enjoyed the presentation, the the maps, the details about uh, various aspects of the 1899 map that we've looked at. I've, I've, as I said, I found it very interesting uh, to research this. So please, if you enjoyed this and found it interesting, then please do forward uh, the, the link, the YouTube link, to anyone else that you think would be interested. So normally if I was giving a talk at the, the History Society or um, one of the other um, societies that, that I talk to, uh, I would just end up by, by indicating that was the end of the presentation and saying thank you for listening. But in this case, I would say thank you for listening and for viewing. I would certainly welcome comments on the presentation and if you have any more information that you'd like to give me or if you would like to correct anything that's in the, the video, then please let me know. My email is herring39 at gmail.com. That's H-E-R-R-I-N-G herring3939 at gmail.com. Bye-bye.